Hey guys, how are you? Pray for the internet connection by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray the buffering <clears throat> doesn't hinder us. In Jesus' name, may the Lord Jesus bless this session, protect us from bad internet connection from buffering so we can focus. Good to see you guys. I tried to do it yesterday. It didn't work. God's will be done. The Lord's will be done. What's up, XX Phillips? How are you, buddy? I hope you got your answer now, XX Phillips. Chaldean Australian, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Sa el nom. Good to see you. Pray we have about at least two hours of unin uninterrupted teaching time by the power of the Holy Spirit because my brother is not here. He can show up any minute. Pray the Lord will occupy him until the session's over so we don't get distracted. And again, I just want to say yesterday, January 6th, was the day in which Armenians, Armenian, Armenians from Armenia, unfortunately, one of the most famous are Armenian families, the Kardashians, right? But anyway, yesterday they were celebrating Christmas. And today you have those of the Orthodox tradition, the Orthodox Church celebrating Christmas. So I want to say to both camps, <clears throat> Merry Christmas to both camps. <clears throat> those who are in love with Jesus, who are born of the Spirit, take <clears throat> these opportunities to proclaim to the world that Emmanuel is born. He was conceived <clears throat> and born from a blessed virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit, a virgin whom no man had touched, conceived and gave birth to Emmanuel, God with us, the eternal Son, the eternal Word, the eternal heart of the Father, who became a flesh and blood human being, a sinless, holy, pure human being, to live the perfect human life and die and accursed death for our salvation. And so we pray Jesus Christ our Lord blesses all our brothers and sisters who are born of the Spirit, united to Jesus Christ by one Spirit, from all these different <clears throat> branches of the Christian faith. Bless them richly, bless us richly, seal us together by the Holy Spirit, cover us by the blood of Jesus Christ, purify us in the blood of Jesus Christ, cleanse and wash us in the blood of Jesus, and fill us with the Spirit to be in love with our God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and love each other for the sake of Jesus. So the Lord Jesus bless all of you who are celebrating Christmas today and celebrated yesterday. But they know, and we know, for us, Christmas and Easter is every day. Every day, by the power of the Holy Spirit, who wakens us up on this side of glory, who awakens us every morning, may the Spirit fill us every day to celebrate the birth of Emmanuel, the God-man, and the fact that he died for us and now rose victorious, destroying the power of Satan, the kingdom of darkness, the power of the grave and death and sin in our lives. Because he lives, we will live, and he can never die. So every day is Christmas and Easter for us. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, we ask that you bless this session. Please, Abba, because of your Holy Spirit, because of Jesus, because of your grace in sending Jesus and pouring out the Spirit, we can call you Abba like Jesus did. And Jesus continues to do so because he is your true son, your spiritual offspring, springing from your eternal heart. We love you, Abba. We love you, Baba. We love you, Babi. We love you, Baban. You are our father. You are the father of our, our loved ones. You are the father of my daughters. You are their true father, our true father, because of Jesus. Bless this session, Father, for the glory of your son, the Lord Jesus, and fill us with the spirit. And Father, please forgive me. Help me not to succumb to my flesh, crucify my flesh, to despise my flesh, to conquer my flesh by the power of your spirit. And forgive me when I fail you, Father. Forgive us when we fail you, Lord, please, to walk in the life of the spirit. More of the Spirit filling us, less of the flesh being filled with the fruit of the Spirit. And Father, please loosen my tongue to speak truth clearly, to recall Scripture correctly, and guide this conversation by the part of the Spirit <clears throat> so that your Spirit will use me to bless your people here. Fill them, Father. Clothe them with your Spirit. Wash them in the blood of Jesus. And help us to love Jesus more passionately to obey him more perfectly, to live for him more faithfully, and even die for him if necessary. And please arise for the defense of your persecuted church, Father. 
destroy the distractions of the enemy, bless the internet connection. And Father, please provide our daily bread to depend on you to provide for us, Father. And Father, bless everyone who, because they love Jesus, <clears throat> have been a blessing to me. Bless them, Father. <clears throat> bless them because they're here, John, by your spirit, because they love you. They want to hear your word. They're in love with Jesus. Fill them. And they love me for the sake of Jesus. Bless those who are praying for me, for my daughters. Bless them who are partnering with me to do this work for your glory. Bless them, Father. Their reward is with you, Father. You are their reward. I cannot repay them. You are their reward. And thank you, Father, for stirring their hearts. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for stirring their hearts. Holy Spirit, thank you for stirring their hearts to, to stand with me. We need you. I need you. We need each other because that's how you designed it. We are members of the body of Jesus, the spiritual body of Christ that cannot be destroyed. Because Christ is risen, risen indeed. We thank you again. We love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Have your way. Loosen my tongue and bless the sound of my voice to the ears of your servants. In Jesus' name, amen. Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Yira, Yahovah Yira, Yahovah Yira. Father, Son, Spirit, in Jesus' name. All right. I think, and in Jesus' name, we're going to get 200 today. Someone got upset and got self-righteous and got on his high horse saying, oh, clickbait, how deceptive, instead of trusting the Holy Spirit. And he got a mouthful. See, these self-righteous dogs don't last with me. <laughs> Pray that I can be more patient, more loving, and that the Lord will destroy my unrighteous anger. And to be bold as a lion, not to be afraid of physical death, but to fear him. Right? Who can destroy both body and soul in hell? Yeah, I'm about the spirit. Generations Faith TV. Let me repeat again. I give you my permission. It's reported. I give you my permission to take all my articles on answeringislam.net, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com, translate them in any language, spread them all over the world. But please, for the love of Jesus, Make sure you keep the name, the URL from where you got it, and the name, not because I want fame, and don't sell them, okay? And you can do the same with my videos. Thank the Lord Jesus for Psalm 23, Revelation 22, 13, for Protestant believer and the rest who download these YouTube sessions or make clips out of them. You have permission. Please, though, just it's not because I want fame. It's just so that people understand, right, where this comes from. Answering Islam, leave the, leave the URL, the name, and don't sell them. Besides, if you sell them, you're going to have to give me 90% of what you make. All right. No, that wasn't you, Alex. No, no, brother. I know you're good. You're a good brother. I know those who love me for the sake of the Lord and just pull my leg. It was someone else out of nowhere with some Nick, uh, some mysterious Nick having his identity, who, where he got on his horse and he thought he's spirit-filled. I'm holier than you, sir. I don't use clickbait. And by the way, you know where I learned this clickbait clickbait from? From Christian Prince. I learned it from him. I said, let me try it. Right? I got it from him. The clickbait. So may the Lord Jesus be glorified and loosen my tongue to speak clearly. All right? Anyway, I want to give you links to articles. I update the blog regularly. So let me give you links. Save these links. Study them. Pass them on, please. I'm doing this so that the Spirit can use my meager efforts to bless you guys so that you can know how to interpret Scripture, teach Scripture, defend Scripture, teach your brothers and sisters locally, right, and live it out for the glory of Jesus. Hopefully not today. So far, the buffering is not bothering. Yep, it is. Someone you may know because I'm on a tight budget. May God have mercy. And I'll say this again. We're not doing it to get rich. Honestly, honest, the Lord knows. If you're looking to make money, you don't do ministry. You do it because you love Jesus and want to be used of Jesus to see other people fall in love with the Lord. But if I had the money of some of these ministries, right, or if I was rich like Brad Pitt, right, I wouldn't be going and buying me a large dollar nine cent coffee from McDonald's. Boy, it tastes good. Anyway, anyway. 
you got to admit, I got the most amazing facial expressions. I am so handsome. I am made for the camera. I should have been in Hollywood. At the very least, I should have been in Bollywood. Bollywood. <laughs> I, have, I don't know the words. Okay, guys, let me give you links to some of the articles, some new articles. This one I published a few days ago. It's a very short article. I have linked the articles on the same topic, but I decided to make a short one. New Testament application of Old Testament Yahweh text to Jesus. I'll put the links to the articles in the description box when it's done. But here, save this link. I'm going to post it three times. Save the links to the article. Study them. Okay, here's another article. Let me find it. Now, for those of you who are talking about God changing, Revelation 22, 13 brought it up. Here's an article I wrote about Allah descending at the third part of every night, at the last part of every night, where he literally descends from above the seven heavens to the lowest heaven. So he changes location. If that's not a change, I don't know what is. So here's that article on that. Save that article. Allah changes locations every night. And by the way, this only makes sense in a flat earth. This only makes sense in a flat earth. You know why? Because to say that Allah descends at the last part of the night, the third part of the night, from above the seven heavens to the lowest heaven, implies that it's going to be the same time the world over. Because if Muhammad knew that the earth was a sphere, he would know that in one part of the earth it would be nighttime, and another part of the earth it would be daylight, afternoon, evening. So save that article. Yep. Now that's one. And then here's another article I just posted today. Justification by faith. Okay, justification by faith from beginning to end the case of Abraham. As you guys know, I do subscribe to the Protestant principle of sola fide, that we are declared righteous and we receive a righteous standing from God as a gracious gift, a gift of his unmerited favor because of what Jesus Christ our Lord did in his perfect life on earth and his death on the cross. And this righteous standing that God grants to us is maintained by the power of the Holy Spirit by faith in Jesus apart from any works we do. I know some disagree with that. That's fine. Here's the article. At least study this article. Hear it out. And I got a book recommendation at the end. One of the best books written from the Protestant understanding of Sola Fide, even our friend Alan Ruhl, who did a post on it. He even he admits, as a Roman Catholic who denies Sola Fide, he admits this is one of the best books written on Sola Fide. James R. White, Dr. James R. White's book, The God Who Justifies. Get that book. You need to get that in your library. If you want a book-length exposition on the passages that teach clearly that we are declared righteous and we are given a righteous standing because of the grace of God apart from any works we do, a standing that is ours, a declaration that God makes because of our faith and trust in Jesus because of what he did, you got to get that book, right? Get that book. Okay, even Alan Ruhl, who I consider a brother in Christ, who doesn't accept sola fide, and I know some Christians say, then why you call him a brother? I got my issues. You may want to knock. Uh, sorry. Anyway, he even said that's one of the best Protestant defenses of sola fide he's ever read. So save that article, because I've seen Genesis 15 verse 6 misused to attack sola fide, right? So I decided I'm going to write something on it. And I'll do, a uh, I'll do a session on Genesis 15, verse 6, if you're interested. But if you guys go back to my archives on my YouTube channel, I have a lot of discussions on salvation, on water baptism, on communion. I even did a full-length discussion on Mary's perpetual virginity. And there I tell you what I believe, right? This is my understanding of, on the basis of Scripture. You're going to disagree with me. Many of you will. That's okay. There are things we can agree to disagree and still love each other as brothers, sisters in Christ. But hear my case. And then if you say, well, I think you're weak here. You're wrong here. Fine. It's okay. 
It's okay for you to disagree with me. Just don't attack me. Don't accuse me like someone did. I had to block someone, right, of circular argumentation, right, of cherry picking because that's not going to last long, okay? Okay? So with that said, keep praying for me. Pray for my daughters. Pray God will give me the health to get healthier, beatify me with the beauty of Christ, to be holier and to be filled with knowledge, wisdom, to teach you all these things in time in Jesus' name. I'm going to teach you all these things if God wants me to in time in Jesus' name. Today we're going to continue discussing 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Lord, bring the people you want to be here for this live stream for your glory in Jesus' name. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Protestant believers should be joining us shortly. If he's not here already, until he does, first and last we'll be posting. So thank God for the admins. Thank God for uh, our brothers and sisters who helped me to help you to glorify Christ. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Oh, by the way, I wrote an article. Should I even mention this? Okay, I'll mention it later. Men remind me to remind you of the article I wrote on the Mass. Okay, and I'll post the link later. Because if you're on my social media pages on my Facebook, I, I already posted it. Anyway, with that said, let's begin in Jesus' name as the Spirit takes over. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. You ready? No distractions, hopefully by the grace of God. This is part two. I already did part one. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 28. This is part two. I already did part one. <laughs> let's read. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. It is vitally important that you go back and listen to first part, part one, the first part of my exposition of 1 Corinthians 15, 28, because I can't simply repeat material I've already discussed by the grace of God. Otherwise, we're going to get nowhere. So I'm going to build on the previous session, demonstrating that this passage does not teach that Jesus is not equal to God the Father. Listen, so you can learn how to refute those who pervert this passage to their shame and destruction. This passage does not teach that Jesus Christ our Lord is not equal to God the Father in essence, in glory, in majesty, in honor, in worship, in beauty, in power. Okay? If you, you need to listen... Hey, my brother Muhammad Faridi is here. If you guys don't know who Muhammad Faridi is, he's a former Shia Iranian Muslim who's now in love with Jesus Christ and has a ministry reaching Muslims for Jesus. And I've done shows with him, right? He can name, he can put the name of his ministry. So he's here, Muhammad Faridi. He's also on social media, is on Facebook. You, you've seen him. I've done some shows where he's sitting there interviewing me. Right? So he can post the link if he wants to, you know. And so Muhammad Fridi, he's like Suleiman. See, did you listen to this? Muhammad Fridi said, Suleimani used to be my boss. He used to be in Iran. He was a militant Muslim, Shia. And Suleimani used to be his boss. He just did an interview about it. Yep, you right there. So he just came here to rain on my parade to get everyone to lose focus. So that all the spotlight will be on him. Everyone give him a... No, I'm kidding. He's a good brother. I'm just kidding. He's a good brother, right? Suleimani used to be his boss, so he knows that man. And now Muhammad Faridi worships Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Now, you can post the links, Muhammad Faridi, because you just did an interview. Muhammad Faridi, pray for my miracle, my breakthrough, for the financial blessing and the shackles to be removed, and pray the Lord brings my daughters. Muhammad Faridi, I found the place... I'm going to be living in my own place February 15, if God wills, through your prayers, because we need the provision. All right, brother? You're making all that money, taking off like David when you forgot me. Just kidding. He's in full-time ministry, too. Anyway, are we ready now? Like people saying, when are you going to get to the meet? What, what do you want me to do? In Jesus' name. Okay, let's begin. You ready? Let's begin. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Remember what I said. You must listen to part one. Because I'm going to build off of the previous discussion to show that Paul is not saying that Jesus is not equal to the Father in essence, in glory, in power, in majesty, in honor, in worship, in beauty. You can be subject to someone. Amen. In Jesus' name, Sam, I receive that. 
you can be subject to someone and still equal to that individual, that person. For example, just to remind you, your boss is greater than you and you're subject to your boss unless you want to get fired and be jobless. But your boss is not superior to an essence in value, in dignity, in self-worth, right? So this is what we call confusing categories, categ categorical fallacies. Category of position and rank versus <clears throat> that of essence and being. You can have two individuals that are equal in one sense, in the category of being in essence and value, but subject to one another in another sense, category of position and authority, right? So Jesus as the son of God is subject to the father. And Jesus as man is subject to the father because Jesus is one person who's the God man. God who took on the nature of a creature who created a human nature and a physical body that he united to his divine person that he's now bound to forever and ever. So in one sense, because Jesus is also a man, the father is greater than him, not only in position, but in respect to his human nature, he'd be greater than him in essence. But don't forget what I said in the previous session. Don't forget what I said in the previous session. Jesus would also, in a sense, his divine nature being fully God, that nature is greater than his human nature. So the sense in which not just the Father, not just the Spirit, but the Son himself in respect to his divine nature would be greater than the very human nature that he has, right? No, well, you didn't miss much. You didn't miss much. Are you with me there? So with Jesus, you're dealing with a unique person, an eternal divine person who took on the nature of a man. So there's two natures united to Christ. So it's a situation in which there is no perfect analogy because Christ with two natures, the God-man, there's nothing analogous to that in creation. So it's something that we won't fully comprehend. We can see what the Bible says. Yeah, this is what it says. And Jesus rose from the dead, leaving the tomb empty, confirming we can take the Bible for what it says and trust what it says about Jesus. So he's the God man, but I don't know how that fully works because God by nature is beyond comprehension. So with that said, let's build off. Now you got to listen to the first session. Please listen to the first session. I'm building my case with each success, successive session. Now, with that said, let me now delve into the to Paul's statement that when Jesus destroys all his enemies, the context of 1 Corinthians 15, which we'll revisit over and over again by the grace of God's spirit, when Jesus destroys all his enemies, the last enemy he'll destroy will be death. Let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 to 28. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 to 28. The last and eight, Muhammad Fridi, you should go to your Facebook and let them know that I'm live streaming so they can come here so you can help my channel blow up. But it's all about you, isn't it? Okay, let's read. Notice what 1 Corinthians 15, 26 stated. Let's read 15, 26, 28. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he had put all things under his feet. God the Father put all things under the feet of Jesus. But when he saith all things are put under Jesus, him, it is clear it is manifest. That he is accepted, that God is not under Jesus, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, when Jesus subdues everything to himself, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, God the Father, that put all things under Jesus, that God may be all in all. So notice what our Lord Jesus is going to do. When he destroys the last enemy, death, he will then present to God a fully restored, a fully reconciled creation, heaven and earth, where there'll be no more opposition to the will of God, no more evil forces seeking to thwart and resist and oppose the will of God because they'll all be destroyed, removed from the earth, so that heaven and earth will be perfectly reconciled to God and God perfectly reconciled to the heavens and the earth so that God and creation will be restored and in perfect union. Right? Is that clear?
just want to make sure. Is that clear? But then it says, when that happens, Jesus will subject himself to God. Now, let me explain what it doesn't mean. That doesn't mean when Jesus destroys death and he subjects himself to God the Father, he will stop reigning. He will stop ruling as King of kings and Lord of lords. It doesn't mean that. So let me prove to you it doesn't mean that. And then by the grace of God, if not in this session, a third session, I'll explain fully what these passages are meant to convey. But I have to build my case. And I'm going to go back and show you other places like I did in the first session where the Apostle Paul clearly proclaims that Jesus is Jehovah God, Almighty of the Old Testament, who became flesh and not a creature. Okay? Now let me show you from Old and New Testaments and Paul specifically that Jesus' rule is forever and ever. He will never stop ruling because as the God-man, as God, one with the Father and the Spirit, he by nature is the creator of all things, who owns all things, and all things are under his authority. Let me prove that, okay? All the New Testaments will proclaim Jesus is an everlasting king whose kingdom is indestructible, who will never stop ruling as king. Old and New Testaments and Paul himself, whose letters are part of the New Testament, all agree. So let's now show you that Paul is not saying there will come a time where Jesus stops ruling. Paul does not believe that. This is why you have to read carefully, prayerfully, carefully, meditate on the word, ask the Spirit to guide you to know what a passage means and what it means and to save you from error and empower you then to live these glorious revealed truths for the glory of Christ. Now, let's go to Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. Isaiah 9, verses 6 to 7. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, a child born who is the Mighty God, being born as a babe, a human baby, a human being, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth, even forever, the God child, the mighty God who will be born as a human baby, becoming a human being to rule on David's throne, will reign as the God man forever. That's one. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Why am I getting so lean? I mean. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Now pay attention. And there was given him dominion and glory <clears throat> and a kingdom that all people Nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom which shall not be destroyed. You don't get any clearer than these passages which state clearly the kingdom of the God-man, the Messiah, the Son of David, the Son of God, the mighty God in the flesh is indestructible. His kingdom never ends. It's indestructible. Buffering. Okay, sorry. Buffering. Pray against it in Jesus' name. No buffering. Please. No buffering. This is the this is the best I can do for now. Okay. Okay. So you see the Messiah, the Son of David, the Son of Man. The God man, his kingdom is everlasting, indestructible. In Jesus' name, Father, Son, and Spirit, by the holy blood of Jesus Christ. Please, Lord. I don't know what's happening. Saba, is your mother human? Saba Vasik, is your mother human? You make a strong case that your parents were dogs. 
Okay, now, coming back to the issue. Two passages that clearly, clearly teach the rule, the kingdom of the Messiah, the son of David, the mighty God born as a human babe, the God-man, the son of man, the divine son of man. His kingdom is indestructible, everlasting. Does the New Testament agree? Let's go to Luke 1. Let's read Luke 1. We're going to skip 26 to 31 and focus on what Gabriel says to the blessed mother of our Lord in Luke 1, 32, 33. Luke 1, 32 to 33. Luke 1, 32, 33. Gabriel telling the blessed mother of our Lord, Mary, he shall be great and he shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now, you know why this is an important witness, folks? Do you know why this statement from Luke's gospel is an important witness? Notice Gabriel announces to Mary that her son, whom she'll give birth to by the power of the Holy Spirit as a virgin, is the child of Isaiah 9. He fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah 9. That's what Gabriel's announcing to the mother of our Lord. Do you know why Luke's recording of this is important? Can someone tell me? Why is Luke's recording of Gabriel's annunciation to Mary that her child, her son, will fulfill Isaiah 9 is important? Anyone get an idea? Well, we know he says forever, but why is him recording the part where it says he'll rule forever and his kingdom have no end is important. Can someone think about it? Why? Focus. Think about it. Think about why it would be important. Why his witness in particular? Anybody? No, not because it's Gabriel. No, 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 no. Not because it fulfills Isaiah. Come on, guys. Think. Think deeply to go into the depth of Scripture. Because Luke is a companion of Paul. Therefore, we would expect that his theology will not contradict Paul's theology. Come on, guys. So if Luke has recorded the Annunciation by Gabriel, Jesus is the child of Isaiah 9, the child born who's a son given, who's the mighty God in the flesh, the God baby that reigns on David's throne forever. Do you think that Paul would then assume that there's some point in the future where Christ will stop ruling as king? You get it now? Let's go to 2 Timothy 4.11. 2 Timothy 4.11. You'll see the importance of Luke's witness. Exactly, Jonathan Simon. Notice Paul writing to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.11. Only Luke is with me. Oh, Paul, so Luke is with you. And tradition says, that's the Luke that wrote Luke and Acts. Take Mark and bring them with thee, for he is profitable for me to me for the ministry. That's one. Let's go to Philemon. It's only one chapter. Philemon, verse 24. Philemon, verse 24. It's only one chapter, 25 verses. Focus, guys, so you can learn the depth of Scripture, the beauty of Scripture. Marcus, Marcus is Mark, by the way. Marcus is Mark. So Mark is there, right? Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas. That's Luke, my fellow laborers. So notice here you have two passages where Luke and Mark know Paul, travel with Paul, and know each other. Because notice what 2 Timothy 4.11 4, said. Only Luke is with me, and Timothy, bring Mark with you. Earlier, in one of his earlier letters, in one of his first imprisonments, Marcus, Mark, and Lucas, Luke were already there with him while he was in prison. That means Luke and Mark, two of the gospel writers, knew each other and knew Paul, and new other eyewitnesses to Jesus. You catch what's happening here? Mark wrote a gospel. Luke wrote a gospel in Acts. Knew each other. Knew Paul. Traveled with each other. Traveled with Paul and other apostles. Okay, now, Colossians. 
Colossians chapter 4, verse 10 and 14. This is another letter that Paul wrote around the same time he wrote Philemon while he was in prison. Colossians 4, verse 10, and then 14, verse 14. Notice again, Aristarchus is mentioned. That was the name mentioned in Philemon because these two letters were written at the same time during the same imprisonment. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner. So he's in prison with me too. Saluteth you. And Marcus, Mark, sister, son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments. He's there too. If he come unto you, receive him. Now notice who else he mentions. Colossians 4.14. Luke, the beloved physician. This is where we get that Luke, the author of Luke and Acts, was a doctor, a physician. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. So Luke knows Paul, traveled with Paul, attended to Paul's needs when Paul was in prison, and knew Mark because Mark was also with him during these events, during at least one of Paul's imprisonments, right? And so if Luke knows Paul, that means he knows Paul's theology. That means when Luke has the angel announcing that Jesus is the mighty God of Isaiah 9, born as a child, the God babe, being born as a human baby, to be the son of David, to rule forever, that means Paul must have known and believed that too. Clear? In fact, you want me to make it even clearer? You want to make it even clearer? You see why I have to do more than one session? And I hope you're appreciating that I'm going slowly and unpacking the depth because my prayer is, Holy Spirit, blow our minds away by unveiling the depth of Scripture, erasing any doubt we have that this is your word and the God of this book is real, he's alive, so we can be in awe of you and in love with you. Okay. Now let me blow you away. Luke 10, verse 7, Luke records our Lord Jesus' instruction to the 70, 72, as he sends them out two by two. Luke 10, 7, pay attention. And in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Pay attention to that phrase. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. Remember that phrase. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Jesus' words recorded by Luke in Greek. And we believe under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now watch what Paul does in 1 Timothy 5, verse 18. It's like saying solely 2, 2, 2, since quantum physics cannot be fully comprehended, why even discuss the mechanics of quantum physics? Because you want to get an idea of the reality of quantum physics, though you may not fully comprehend it. Soli, keep your opinions to yourself, friend. You'll sound smarter if you don't say much, because I love you and I say that. 1 Timothy 5, 18. For the scripture saith... Paul is now quoting inspired scripture, scripture produced by God, produced by the spirit. For the scripture saith, thou shall not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. That's Deuteronomy 25 verse 4. Quoting Moses, that scripture, because we know Moses' scripture, but now notice the second citation. And the laborer is worthy of his reward. Paul just quoted Luke 10, 7. Paul just quoted Luke 10, verse 7, and placed Luke 10, 7, along with Deuteronomy 25, 4, a command God revealed through Moses, which Moses wrote down, and classified Luke's gospel as part of that scripture on the level of Moses' writing. Now, in the King James, you don't see that the Greek is identical. Let me show you now the Greek. The Greek is identical in Luke 10, 7 and 1 Timothy 5, 18, making it irrefutably clear that Paul is quoting Luke. Irrefutable. To anyone who has eyes to see and ears to hear, who's honest to God, can't refute it. But if you're a deceiver and a liar and don't care what God's word says, then you're going to explain it away. Guys, I want you to go here. Here's the link. I'm going to give you the Greek in transliteration. Okay, because o igartes to mistu autu. It's ke axios o igartes to mis mistu autu. Okay, now 
That's the Greek. You don't need to read Greek. They give you the Greek in English letters. Click on that link. I'm going to go to 1 Timothy 5.18, and I'm going to show you that the Greek is identical in both places. Okay? Okay, watch here. Here you go. Now, here's the Greek of 1 Timothy 5.18. Here is 1 Timothy 5, 18. If you're 10, you shouldn't be on this station. You need parental supervision. God bless you. I'm kidding, Sienna. God bless you. Okay, now, go there. You're going to see that last citation. If you look at it, it's K or Kai, Axios, or Irgetes, Irgetes, Irgetes. Trying to say it like a Greek. <laughs> I'm trying to speak Greek, man. Not Erasmian. Ha, could you ask me? Ha, could it? No. I'm trying to say how que exios o irgetes tu mistu au tu. Okay. See there in 1 Timothy 5, 18. Now go back to Luke 10. It's word for word identical in the Greek. Thank you. Guys. Word for word, identical in the Greek. Tell Sargon to reboot. That's probably why. In other words, if you're reading the Greek of Luke 10, 7 and the Greek of 1 Timothy 5, 18, there is no doubt Paul is quoting Luke's gospel. And he's quoting it to Timothy. And he's saying this gospel of Luke is scripture. And it's on the level of the law of Moses. The law of Moses, which he quotes, Deuteronomy 25, 4, Luke's gospel, which he quotes, Luke 10, 7, they are both scripture produced by God because Luke is writing down the life and teachings of Jesus. That means Paul knows the gospel of Luke. And he quotes the gospel of Luke as scripture. And that means the gospel of Luke was circulating to such an extent that Paul can quote Lou's gospel to Timothy and not tell Timothy where he's quoting from because he knows that Timothy knows that this citation comes from Luke's gospel, just like he's aware that Timothy would know that the first citation comes from Moses' law. You see what's happening? And the reason why Paul is quoting Luke's gospel, not Mark, Let's go to 2 Timothy 4.11 again. And I have an article on this, and I've done sessions on this, Billy Ray. It's not the first time I'm mentioning this. Okay? Here's why in 1 Timothy 5.18, he quotes Luke's gospel. Guess who's with him? Only Luke is with me. So doesn't it make sense that since Luke is with Paul during the time that he's writing these letters to Timothy, that Paul would quote Luke's gospel? Do you see it? Second Timothy 4.11. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. But folks, understand the implication. Luke is a Gentile. He's not an apostle. And Paul is a Jew, an apostle commissioned by the risen Christ. And yet he acknowledges that what his companion wrote is scripture the very words of God inspired to Luke? So an apostle confirms, acknowledges, amends that the writing of this Gentile companion of mine, that writing is scripture inspired by the Spirit because it's the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <whistles> What's going on here? Is it making sense now? But wait. If we believe that Luke was written after Matthew and Mark, let's look at 2 Timothy 4.11 one more time. Sarah Matthew, God bless you. May the Lord continue to use me to bless you. Pay attention now. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee. So Timothy, find Mark, bring him with you when you come to see me. 
hold on. If Luke's gospel is already written when Paul is writing these letters to Timothy, and Luke is with him, with Paul, which explains why he quote Luke's gospel, and yet Mark is going to join Timothy in visiting Paul and Luke, and Luke's gospel is written after Mark, that means we have now confirmation that Luke and Mark would have known that both of them have written gospels and Luke may have even used Mark's gospel to write his showing that neither man was in competition, but that they both acknowledge they were writing scripture inspired by the spirit. See how that works. You catching it? Sinking in or no? At the very least, if Mark's gospel wasn't written at that time, Mark, knowing Luke, and Paul quoting Luke's gospel at the same time that Timothy's going to bring Mark, would show us that Mark would have at least consulted Luke's gospel if Mark was later. Either way, you have now independent evidence because First and Timothy circulated independently, right? that two of the writers of the Gospels, Luke and Mark, knew each other and would have been aware of the writings of the other. And that shows you they were not in competition, but they acknowledge that what the other wrote is Scripture. Can you send this barking dog out his merry way? Soli 222, he's, he's someone that gets no attention and love and wants to get attention and love, but he's not getting it here. Yep, happy. You know, it's even more boring discussing who actually fathered you because I know you're upset to this day that the 20 men that your mother <clears throat> knew, she can't tell you, even with DNA testing, which of them fathered you. See, these guys think they're going to come here and attack the Bible, mock the Bible, or distract, and I'm going to be, Jesus loves you, happy. Jesus loves you. Oh, are boring? How can I tickle your earth? Do you want me to tell? Sorry, wrong channel. Wrong channel. You want to get love? Go to David Wood's channel. And you can tag and mock the Bible, and he'll just say, Jesus, Jesus loves you happy. Happy, happy, joy, joy. Happy, joy. Yee! All right, okay. All right. Clear, everyone? <laughs> <laughs> I got issues, dude. You tell me I'm not proof that Jesus saves the foolish things of this world, people with serious mental health issues to transform them for his glory. I am proof of that. I am proof of 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 29, that God chooses the foolish things of the world, marginalized things of the world, to transform them by his spirit to silence the scholars of this age because you don't get more mentally challenged than me. I mean... How many apologists and pastors you, you'd hear in the middle of a sermon going, happy, happy, joy, joy. It's all about love, right? Where is the love you've been hearing of? Right? right? In Jesus' name. Okay, so so far are you with me? Now, what was the point? What was the point here? Here's the point. Have I established that Paul knows Luke and quotes Luke's gospel? Has that been established? Paul knows Luke and quotes Luke's gospel. I'll dance later, Charles. Has that been established? Now, Paul quotes Luke's gospel as scripture, meaning breathed out by God. But that's the same Luke that says, the angel Gabriel told Mary, Jesus is the... Virgin-born child of Isaiah 9, the child born who's a son given, who's the mighty God being born as a human babe to sit on David's throne forever. Do you think that Paul will then contradict that testimony, the testimony of a book that he called Scripture? Do you think he's going to contradict that? In other words, whatever 1 Corinthians 15, 28 is saying, it cannot be saying 
that Jesus' rule will end. Paul doesn't believe that, and none of the biblical writers believe that, right? Especially when the Gospels and Acts and Revelation identify Jesus as the Son of Man. Do you remember the prophecy in Daniel 7, 13 and 14, where it says, Daniel saw in the night vision one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, approaching the Ancient of Days, and to him was given dominion and power and glory that all nations should serve him, and his dominion is everlasting dominion that cannot will not end, cannot be destroyed. Well, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, and even Revelation, Jesus is that son of man. Let me show you in Acts. Acts 7, 55 to 56. And I'll show you one from Mark. Acts 7, 55 to 56. Okay. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, no, David, would have, there's a lot wrong with him, but he's still our brother in Christ, and we love him in spite of his issues. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, 56, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So here, Stephen sees heaven open and Jesus, the Son of Man, standing at God's right hand because he's the Son of Man of Daniel. And Luke records this. Okay. Let's go to Mark 14. Mark 14, 61 to 62. Mark 14, 61 to 62. Mark 14, 61, 62. But, the high, but he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Clearly, Jesus now identifies himself as the son of man of Daniel 7, who comes in the clouds of heaven, who sits at God's right hand. So all the gospels agree with this. All the gospels agree with this, right? But let me show you again from Luke itself that Jesus claims to be the son of man. I'll skip Matthew because... We want to just focus on Luke. Why on Luke? Because no one can argue that Paul is not aware of Luke and Luke's gospel. So no one can argue that Paul is not aware of these statements. If Luke says Jesus, son of man, you better believe Paul believed Jesus is son of man of Daniel. Luke 17, 24 to 25. Exactly, Mickey Ephrata. Mickey Ephrata just brought up something. Pay attention to what he said. Mickey Ephrata just said, it proves that Paul believed in the virginal conception and birth of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because one of the criticisms is that Paul did not know the virgin birth. How could Paul not know the virgin birth when he's quoting the gospel of Luke that mentions the virgin birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Exactly, Mickey. Luke 17, 24 to 25. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven, this is Jesus speaking, our Lord speaking, shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things and be re rejected of his generation. So Luke records Jesus claiming to be that Son of Man whose appearing is like lightning that everyone sees and won't be hidden. And yet he must first suffer before he appears in glory. Luke 22, 70 to 71. Luke 22, 70 to 71. Then said they all, Art thou then the Son of God? And he said unto them, Yet ye say that I am. And they said, What need any... What need we any further witnesses for? We ourselves have heard of his own mouth. So now, 70, 71. Let's read now 66 to 69. Let's read the context. 66 to 69. Real quickly. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and scribes came together and led him into their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. So not only does he say, yes, I am the Son of God, but I'm also the Son of Man that will be sitting on the right hand of the power of God. You catch it? 
And this was in the morning proceedings, the morning proceedings. The reason why I mentioned Luke, because Mark 14 is recording the night proceedings. What took place at night, Luke 22, 66, 71 is the morning proceedings the next day where they again ask him and Jesus confirms again. So Mark gives you the night proceeding when the high priest asked them. And then Luke gives you the morning proceeding where they basically ask him the same thing again. Everyone there? Okay, Billy Ray, let me tell you why. Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, was about to be killed, the first Christian martyr. So Jesus, in love for his servant, stood up to honor him and greet him. Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who loves us, who's in love with us, is humble enough to do what other kings are reticent to do. Stand up from his throne and look at his servant and comfort him. Don't be afraid. You will be with me in a second. Don't fear what they're about to do to you. I'm standing with my arms stretched out to embrace you, my son and my servant, my faithful martyr. That's why. Did you get it now, Billy Ray? Because Billy Ray just asked, Jesus is sitting. Why is he standing? He's standing because the king of glory is not an arrogant tyrant like Allah of Muhammad who calls himself Al-Mutakabbir. One of the names of Allah, Al-Mutakabbir, the proud one, the arrogant one, the haughty one. Our God is humble, compassionate, meek, and gentle. And that's why he can humble himself to be a man, humble himself to wash the feet of sinners, even the one who's, who's going to betray him, Humble himself to assume very humble, poor circumstances, choosing parents who were poor to raise him and not being born to a king in a palace. Humble enough to allow wicked, filthy, sinful hands to beat him to a bloody pulp, whoop him to the point of death and put spikes and nail him to a cross and humble enough to say, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. That's the true God, a God of infinite love, compassion, meekness, gentleness, humbleness, <clears throat> glory, power, majesty. That's the God we serve. Clear? Is that my boy Al D? Al Darius? Okay, in Jesus' name. Is that clear? Okay, so does Luke agree that Jesus claimed to be the son of man of Daniel? Does Luke agree? The son of man of Daniel. But the son of man of Daniel is a divine being appearing in human semblance whose kingdom is indestructible, who rules forever and all nations worship him. If Luke is confirming that's who Jesus is, and Luke knows Paul, and Paul knows Luke, and Paul quotes Luke's gospel. You're telling me Paul didn't believe that? Paul didn't believe that? Okay, now, Acts 16, 14 to 18. Let me blow you guys even further by showing you not only does Paul mention Luke is with him and quotes Luke's gospel as scripture, putting it on the level of Moses' writing. But that Acts itself testifies Luke was an eyewitness to many of the events in Paul's life. Read with me carefully and see if you catch the plural. Acts 16, 14 to 18. Luke witnessed even the miracles that Paul and others did in the mighty name of Jesus. Read. Acts 16, 14 to 18. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us. Luke, you're part of that group? Yes, us, us. I was one of them. Pay attention to the plural pronouns. Whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of God. Now notice 15. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us. She beseeched us. I was included. Saying, if ye, meaning all of you, have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. 
and she constrained us. So wait, Luke, you were there with Paul and others when this happened? Yeah. Oh, it gets better. Acts 16, 16, 18. And it came to pass as we went to prayer. We, I'm part of the group with Paul. I'm an eyewitness. I saw this with my own eyes and I'm willing to die for this because I'm not lying. As we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us. This demonized girl would follow us and Paul and us and cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Wait, wait, wait. These men, Luke is one of them. Luke and Paul and the others are the servants of the most high God. Who show us salvation? Really? Now notice verse 18. Notice verse 18. And this did she many days. But Paul being grieved turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. So now folks, notice the evidence that God has given us to trust the Bible as historically accurate as the inspired word of God so we can have confidence in believing these stories happen and these words were spoken. Luke is saying, I was there. I'm writing down what I saw. I was there when Lydia constrained us to stay in her house. I was there when I saw a girl possessed of a demon and an evil spirit kept bothering us for days, saying we are the servants of the Most High and that Paul did a miracle in the name of Jesus casting that evil spirit. I was there. So since Luke confirms he was an eyewitness to Paul and to many of the events that he records in, in Acts, and Paul confirms that Luke was with him and quotes Luke's gospel as scripture, you want to convince me that Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 28 is contradicting what his protege Luke wrote down and identifying Jesus as the mighty God of Isaiah 9, born as a child, the God babe who rules on David's throne forever, and then contradict what Luke wrote in identifying Jesus as the son of man of Daniel, who rules forever, whose kingdom is indestructible. You want to convince me that's what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 15, 28? So that's what's happening? Is that clear? Just want to make sure you got it. So much meat. Since we're on the subject of Luke knowing the eyewitnesses, did you know he also met James, the Lord's brother? Kevin Poo, if you're not paying attention, you're not going to last here long. Let me show you where he met James, the Lord's brother. Acts chapter 28, verses 18 and 20. So we can go into the, the issue. Just want to show you, because I did this in a previous session on the inspiration of scriptures. Acts 26. Wait, you just got me confused now. Acts 21, 16. Acts 21, 18 to 20. I'm sorry. Acts 26 is another good one. Right? Acts 21, 18 to 20. Sorry about that, man. Mental breakdown. Acts 21, 18 and 20, pins and needles. And the day following, Paul went in with us. Notice the plural, went in with us. Us, I was there, unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Did you catch what he said? Paul went in with us to James in Jerusalem. I went up to Jerusalem with Paul and I met James, not James, the brother of John, because he had already been killed in Acts 12. That James was killed in Acts 12, verses 1 and 2. James, the Lord's brother, the head of the church in Jerusalem. So wait, Luke, you're saying you met Paul? Yes. You're an eyewitness to the miracles that Paul did? Yes. You also saw James, the Lord's brother in Jerusalem? Yes. James, the one who grew up with Jesus in Jesus' home, in his house? Yes. No wonder you know so much about Mary's perspective of the conception and birth of Jesus 
And what Mary was thinking and what she pondered in her heart, as recorded in Luke 1 and 2, because who better than James to tell you what his mother thought, because who better than James to know the circumstances surrounding the, the birth of Jesus and the things Mary felt, saw, and did with Jesus than someone who was raised in the same household. You got it? Presumably he did. We don't know. But I want you to see what the implication is. The implication is, even if he didn't meet Mary, they would have met the members of Jesus' household. Now, some people don't believe these are the brothers of Christ. That's not the debate for it today. But the fact is, it now makes sense. Paul and Luke knew each other. Paul and Luke knew James, the Lord's brother. James was raised in Jesus' household. So who better than James, if he didn't interview Mary directly, who better than James to be a source of accurate information for Luke in regards to Jesus' conception and birth and upbringing? Right? Is that clear? So to stick to the point, we got other verses to look at, but let me just remind you of the verses thus far. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 to 7. Daniel 7, verses 13 to 14. Luke 1, verses 32 to 33. All affirm Jesus Christ being the child who was born, the son given of Isaiah 9, who is the mighty God in the flesh, the mighty God, the God babe, the God who became a human baby and became a human man, who is the son of man that Daniel saw riding the clouds of heaven, being that one, Jesus is an eternal king with an eternal kingdom, a kingdom that will never end, can never be destroyed. And then Luke quotes Jesus, identifying himself as that son of man of Daniel, and then records Stephen's vision, seeing Jesus as he's filled with the Spirit, and as filled with the Spirit, calling Jesus the son of man. But it gets better. 2 Peter 1, verse 11. 2 Peter 1, verse 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How long is Jesus' kingdom? Everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You got it? Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 26. What's the last enemy to be destroyed? What's the last enemy to be destroyed? 1 Corinthians 15, 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Okay, pay attention to it with me. Death will be destroyed. Then the new heaven and new earth will be ushered in, and there will be immortality. No more death on earth. Okay. Let's go to Revelation 20, 10 to 15. Revelation 20, 10 to 15. got to go upstairs. Okay, guys. Sorry. i got to go upstairs. Don't you love a live stream? Jesus. Man. Sorry. This is what's beautiful about live streams. Okay. Okay. Revelation 20, 10 and 15, we're going to read. It's not mine, Cindy. Or I'll get one for my daughter. It's not for me. Okay, let's read. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet shall be, are. Not shall be, they're already there. Pay attention. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Notice, Satan is thrown in hell before death is destroyed. Satan is thrown in hell before death is destroyed. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. 
and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. Now pay attention. When is death destroyed? After Satan is thrown into hell. So Revelation confirms Paul, showing these books are supernatural, divine in origin, which is why there are no real contradictions. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and, the, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, right? Pay attention. Amazing, the supernatural consistency of this book, because it's God's word and God is real. And whatsoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Do you see how Revelation confirmed Paul, even though they're written at different times by different individuals? The death that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians is physical death. Don't take my word for it. The entire chapter is about resurrection from physical death. Re re resurrection from physical death. So when he says that the last enemy will be, Lord Jesus, take over my mouth by the power of the Spirit. So when he says that the last enemy that will be destroyed is death, he means physical death. Did you see the sequence in Revelation? Satan is not the last enemy destroyed. He's thrown into the lake of fire, and then physical death is destroyed. Just like Paul said, two different writers writing at two different times, and yet no contradiction, perfect consistency, because the author is actually one, the Holy Spirit, who used these human vessels. Is that amazing? Uh, blackmail, I'm going to block you so you never come back here. I don't want people like you who are self-righteous Pharisees and hypocrites. If this is love, you can keep it. Love your wife and your mother. You want me there? You, you, you see that, Dominus? Two different writers writing at two different times, and yet neither one contradicting each other when it comes to how all of this will unfold. Because 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 1 down is about physical resurrection, the destruction of physical death. And he says the last thing that Jesus will destroy is physical death. Revelation says Satan's thrown in hell and then physical death is abolished and thrown into hell. Wow. And you want to convince me these books are not inspired by the same spirit? using different human authors, incorporating their personalities, but guiding them in such a way where they don't contradict but illuminate one another? Okay, now what's my point? So far you're with me. So Revelation 20, Jesus has destroyed physical death. Now what happens? Let's reach Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. So you see I'm making a case for what this passage does not mean. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. So God the Father will join Jesus and dwell with glorified human beings in a new heaven, new earth, a new Eden, paradise earth. Join Jesus with glorified believers on earth, right? I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now watch. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the more, former things are passed away. So notice, when death is destroyed, new heaven and earth ushered in, believers in our glorified, transform to live immortal, indestructible lives, physical indestructible bodies, moral incorruptibility with the Godhead on earth, where there'll be no more evil, no more sin, no more Satan, no more death. Now, 
Will Jesus reign after that? Yep, Revelation 22, verses 1 to 5. Revelation 22, verses 1 to 5. See, I'm taking you step by step to show you that even after death is destroyed, the last enemy and a new heaven, new earth is ushered in, and believers are glorified, transformed, which is also touched upon by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. That same chapter talks about being transformed in the twinkling of an eye, putting on immortality, becoming imperishable. We never die. Well, that's what Revelation is talking about. Even when that moment takes place, Jesus still rules on the throne with the Father. Here you go. Revelation 22, verses 1 of 5. Pay attention. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne, singular, one throne of God and of the Lamb. End of story. One throne, two occupants. God and the Lamb occupy one throne, even in the new heaven, new earth, after physical death has been destroyed, believers are made immortal, physical, physically indestructible, morally incorruptible. In an earth, there will be no more corruption, no more sin, no more death. Even then, Jesus reigns with God on the throne on earth. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree, trees were for the healing of the nation. Now pay attention to three. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne, singular, not thrones, of God and the Lamb. One throne, two occupants. God and the Lamb sit on one throne. Even then, their throne shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face. And his name shall be on their foreheads. And now notice verse 5. Okay. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Oh, my goodness. Whew. Folks, did you catch it? First Prince 15 is a succinct discussion of the destruction of physical death. Believers being transformed to become immortal, imperishable. When Jesus comes at the last trumpet, even says last trumpet, mentions the last trumpet, which is the seventh trumpet in Revelation. At the last trumpet will be transformed in a twinkling of an eye. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 58. We'll put on imp imp the imperishable. We'll no longer die. We'll become physically indestructible, morally incorruptible. When Jesus comes to destroy physical death. That's exactly the sequence in Revelation. Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. Physical death is destroyed. The dead are raised. The wicked are thrown into the lake of fire. Believers are made physically indestructible, morally incorruptible. The heaven and earth are transformed where there'll be no more wickedness, no more sin, no more pain, no more death, no more curse, no more Satan. The Godhead living on earth, reigning on earth over a body of glorified believers who are now made physically indestructible and morally incorruptible. And even from that point, Jesus continues to rule over them. So at what point does Jesus stop reigning? At what point does Jesus stop reigning? Now, Final line of evidence so I can wrap this up. Okay. Final line of evidence so I can wrap this up. Early tradition stated that Hebrews was one of the inspired letters of Paul. And you can make a strong argument that it is a letter of Paul, but he used and what they call an amanuensis, amanuensis, a scribe, a secretary to write for him. Even in the case of, like, say, James White, he believes that Luke may have been the scribe that Paul used to write Hebrews because the Greek of Hebrews is polished like the Greek of Luke and Acts. So early tradition believes that Paul used a scribe, if he didn't write it himself, to write down Hebrews. And there's internal evidence to suggest that Paul wrote this. And I believe he did. I believe he used a scribe and the spirit inspired Paul to tell the scribe what to write down. One of the reasons why I believe Hebrews comes from Paul because look at Hebrews 13, 23. And by the way, if you are Roman Catholic, at the Council of Trent in 1546, 
In fact, if you're a Roman Catholic, put a one. I want to show you something. Any Roman Catholic here? Okay. Chaldean Assyrian, don't take my word for it. The Council of Trent, 1546, generation. Listen to this. The Council of Trent, this is for you Catholics. The Council of Trent in 1546 attributed Hebrews to Paul because they said Paul wrote 14 letters. You only get 14 letters when you include Paul. I'm sorry, when you include Hebrews. So even at this council, which Roman Catholics believe is infallible, because you guys believe it's infallible, I'm just saying, 14 letters are attributed to Paul. You only get 14 letters if you count Hebrews among them. If not, it's only 13 letters. So for those of you who come from a Roman Catholic tradition, this is your tradition. Don't argue against your council. You believe it's authoritative. But I have found a willingness on part of Roman Catholics to even question what's supposed to be infallible pronouncements. You believe in its infallibility. So I'm just letting you know, the Roman Catholic Church pronounced 14 letters of Paul. You don't get 14 letters of Paul if you omit Hebrews. You only get 13. Okay. Now, with that said, for those of you who believe the King James translation is the perfect translation of God's words in English, and I believe that too. If you actually look at the book of Hebrews, there's a superscription. The epistle to the Hebrews by St. Paul. Even the King James translators believe that. So John Chesterton. Again, we have Rome, we have Orthodox here. I think they can confirm. I believe they can confirm that it's also the position church that Paul wrote Hebrews. Okay. Okay, so with that said. Let's go to Hebrews 13.23. With that said, let's go to Hebrews 13.23. Is a buffer? Don't worry, I'll walk around. We were saying that. Right, hold on. I thought my brother was here. Hold on. Let me take you back. You got to admit, man, I'm getting so muscular and so beautiful and so gorgeous. <laughs> Let me just take you a tour. The Lobo. The Lobo. All right. All right. Now let's do this. Okay. Hebrews 13, 23. I got to go back up. Yeah. Let's quote it. Sorry, guys. I hope it's still good. Love is exciting. And know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty with whom, if you had come shortly, I will see you. Did you catch it? Our brother Timothy. Indicating that the author knows Timothy. Right? Okay, hopefully the connection will stay. Okay. Why did I, Why am I giving you this evidence? Let's go to Hebrews 1, 8 to 9. Here's why. Here's why. Here's why. Almost done with this session. Hebrews 1, 8 to 9. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Did you catch it? Hebrews quotes Psalm 45, 6 to 7, and says, These words are about Jesus uttered by the Father. So the, the Father says to Jesus, to the Son, Your throne, O God. So the Father calls Jesus Hathaos in the Greek. and the Greek, it's Hathaos. Your throne, the God, is forever and ever. So if Paul did write this, here is proof that Paul believed that Jesus is the God whose kingdom is forever, whose throne endures forever. Now, even if you don't believe Paul wrote it, even if you don't believe Paul wrote it, it still comes from those who knew Paul. Even if you believe Paul didn't write it, it still comes from those who knew Paul. How do we know? Because Hebrews 13, 23 mentions Timothy. The fact that Timothy is mentioned shows that the author Knows Timothy, so that means he knows Paul and knows Paul's theology. The last thing this author would do is contradict Paul's theology. So Paul did not believe that Jesus is the God who rules forever. Why then would an author who knows Paul, if it's not Paul, I believe it is Paul using a scribe, but let's say it's not, who knows Paul and knows the companions of Paul, teach a theology that goes against Paul. So either way, you have now further evidence like we do from Luke 
that Paul did believe, must have believed, in union with the other Christians, Jesus is the God who rules forever. Is that clear so far? Am I making sense? Because we're going to wrap things up. This is part two. God willing, I got to do a part three. I got to do a part three. Now, for the icing on the cake. Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. As the Lord Jesus blesses the connection, stay strong for a few more minutes. And I might do another session later tonight. We'll see if the Spirit leads. We'll see how the Spirit leads. Ephesians 1, 19 and 23. This is now Paul. Read with me. Read with me, please. Pay attention. By the power of the Holy Spirit, let's get this. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he, God the Father, being God the Father, wrought, he de demonstrated, displayed, showed this power in Christ when he raised him, raised Jesus from the dead and set him, set Jesus, his son, at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Now pay attention to Paul's language. Christ, when he sat at God's right hand, became far above all, not some, all principality and power and might and dominion and every name, not some name, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Right there, end of the end of story. 21 says, Jesus not only reigns supreme, far above every rule and power and authority and name, far above all creation in this age, this world, he will continue to reign far above in the world to come, the age to come. Well, in the world to come, the age to come, is the everlasting age where death is abolished. No more death, but a new heaven, new earth. And Paul says Jesus will continue to reign supreme far above all creation, even in that age. Now let's read 22, 23. And here, if you want the connection to 1 Corinthians 15, do you want the connection to 1 Corinthians 15? Pay attention. And has put all things under his feet. Sound familiar? Has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. All things under his feet. That's the same language in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, or 25 to 28. So Paul clearly teaches Jesus will not stop ruling when he subjects himself to God at the end of the age when physical death is destroyed. But Jesus will continue to rule supreme far above all creation even after physical death is destroyed after the age to come. So Paul clearly believes Jesus will never stop ruling, but he'll rule forever and ever. Right? And here, first last is going to put 1 Corinthians 15, 25, 28. So you see the language is the same to Ephesians. Has put all things under his feet. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, 25, 28. For he, Jesus, must reign till he had put all enemies under his feet. Same language of Ephesians. And then 26 to 28. And then we're going to do a part three, God willing. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now watch, 27. For he hath put all things under his feet. That's Ephesians 1, 22. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted. God the Father is not under Jesus. That's what he's saying. God the Father is not one of the things under Jesus. Because God the Father is not part of all things, meaning all creation. All things means all creation. He's separate from it. So it is manifest. It's clear that God the Father is not under Jesus, which did put all things under Christ. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now, is it clear, if you read the Bible consistently and accurately, Jesus will continue to rule. After physical death is destroyed, after he subjects himself to the Father, because his rule will continue forever and ever, and he'll never stop ruling as King of kings, Lord of lords, far above all creation. Was that clear even from Paul? Was that clear even from Paul? Okay, then if it's clear, here's where those blinded by Satan and their tradition don't see Paul's point. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Let's end it with a bang. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Let's look at it again. Yeah. Pay attention. 
the son, when he subjects himself to the father, that will result in God being all in all. Let me explain what that means, God be all in all. God be all in all means God and creation will be fully reconciled, will be at perfect peace with one another. No more division, no more opposition, no more hatred, no more wrath, <clears throat> no more evil. God and creation fully reconciled. But guess what, folks? If you saw that Jesus continues to rule forever and will continue to rule supreme over all creation, even in that age, you just made a case that when Paul says God will be all in all, that includes Jesus. The God who's going to be fully reconciled to all creation, the God who will be all in all, is not just the Father. It's the Father and the Son and the Spirit. In other words, this is a Trinitarian passage. It's saying the Godhead. The Father with the Son and Spirit will be all in all. So this passage is not excluding Jesus from the realm of God. It's actually including Jesus as that God who will be all in all. He is that God with the Father and the Spirit who will be all in all. That's Paul's point. And to prove to you that Paul believes that Jesus is the God who's all in all, Colossians 3.11. Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Paul, how could you say that in reference to believers right now, Christ is all in, in all of us? We who have been reconciled by faith, Christ is already all and in all. Why would you take that language that you apply to God and apply it to Christ? Because Paul's point is, it's not just the Father. Nor is it just the Son, nor is it just the Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are already all in and in all in reference to believers who are redeemed and reconciled. And that same Father, Son, Holy Spirit will then be all and in all when Jesus destroys physical death, the last enemy, and this age ends and the new age is ushered in. He is part of that God, included in that God will be all in all. That's Paul's point in 1 Corinthians 15, 28. So if you correctly interpret 1 Corinthians 15, it's not a refutation of Jesus' deity. It is an affirmation, a clear, explicit affirmation. That God will be fully reconciled to all creation, who will be all in all, is not just the Father. It's the Father with His Son and the Spirit. And I'm going to prove it to you by going to Revelation 22 again. All right. Let me prove it to you by going through Revelation 2. But before we do that, let's see what this the water of life represents. The spring of living waters, the spring of the water of life. John 7, 38 to 39. John 7, 38 to 39. Let's see what the spring of the water of life or living waters symbolize. John 7, 38, 39. Guys, pay attention. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So the river of the water of life, rivers of living water, rivers of the water of life. Don't pay, don't forget this expression. But this spake he of the spirit. So who is the rivers of living water? The spirit. John just told you that's the spirit. Which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Here is the passage that affirms when death is destroyed, physical death is destroyed, the new heavens and new earth are ushered in, and all evil is removed. No more pain, no more sin, no more suffering, no more death, but a perfect humanity and a restored creation dwelling in the presence of the Godhead who will now come to the earth and rule on earth. Here's a proof this includes Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Don't forget the river of living waters, water of life. Here you go, Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. Here you go. And we're going to end it. Here you go. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. Hmm. Sound familiar? River of water of life. Rivers of living water. Crystal, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. There you go, folks. The Holy Spirit being symbolized as pure river of water of life flowing from the throne of God and Jesus. The one throne 
of God and Jesus that's on earth, from that one throne, from them comes the river of the water of life, the Holy Spirit, who animates creation, sustains creation, and preserves creation, who flows from the throne of God and the Lamb. There is your trinity right there in the age to come. The Trinity, that's the God who is all and in all. Clear? Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Please forgive us when we fail. and Give us the power of your Spirit to die to our flesh and to walk in the Spirit, in the life of the Spirit, and the fruits from your Spirit. Wash us in the blood of Jesus. Wash our loved ones. Wash my daughters in the blood of Jesus. Seal them and flood them in the love of Christ. And Father, grant us the holiness we need to delight your heart. Give us the health we need to do this work. And Father, please provide the provisions to start a new life here, trusting you'll bring my daughters to me. Use these sessions and these articles for your glory, Father. Bless your people here and fill them with your passion and your love and your boldness and your wisdom and knowledge and fill them with the Spirit, and fill them with faithfulness and trust in Jesus to become more like Jesus, Father. We need you. We depend on you, Lord. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, do pray. February 15, I move into my new place. But I need, by the grace of God, for an abundance of provisions, that by the grace of God, if the Lord wants me to do ministry, he will sustain me financially to take care of my girls and myself, but right now, this month, I need just some additional provisions because you're going to need deposit. You're going to need you know, uh, the rent, and you're going to need utilities. So pray that people will be stirred up by the grace of God if they want to give something on Patreon or PayPal because by February 15, I got to get into this place, make sure the deposit, the rent, all of that, utilities, for at least till April because my other brother will be joining me in March. And once he does, by April, he can help me with the financial burden so that I can be sustained to glorify the Lord, to do this work and make sure my daughters are taken care of and never neglected and pray for them. So if the Lord stirs your heart and want to do that, God bless you. If not, just keep praying because we have a rich father. And I love you for the sake of Jesus. Lord willing, I may do another show tonight. Just check out any announcements on my Facebook. I may do a session. A little later tonight, if I'm able to. If not, God willing, I'll do one tomorrow. But I love you guys for the sake of the Lord. I hope you're blessed, blown away. Do pray and fast for me and pray for those provisions. And flood my daughters in your prayers. They need it. And I can't wait to see them. By faith, I will see them sooner than later. Take care, guys. Lord bless you.